Well, first, may I say welcome to everybody, and um, I think that we're in for a, an interesting experience. Normally, when you make an introduction, you need to make an introduction. I don't really think I need actually to say anything, but despite that uh, self-admonition, I will nonetheless carry on. But welcome to everybody. Um, I think probably the best way of introducing Harvey is to quote Bono, who said, without Harvey, the live aid might have remained a list of expletions, expletives um, on answer phones all over the world. I think that aptly captures what this man has done and is continuing to do. He, his life was portrayed, or this particular live aid was portrayed, as some of you may know, in a film. The actor who played him, interestingly, subsequently played John Lennon, so I hope um, he is, was suitably flattered for that. Um, but that showed how, what an enormous difficulty he faced in getting that iconic uh, Live Aid performance. I'll mention a little bit uh, later on about that. Harvey is known to everybody in the, in, the, in the music world and really, as I've said, doesn't need any introduction. But what it does is that his career began here in Brighton here at the Brighton College of Technology, which subsequently has become the University of Brighton. He was a student in pharmacy. I, I don't think pharmacy lost much by his continuing to give to the world something completely new. So he began as an entertainment organiser for, for his own college. That gradually spread, success spreads, along the south coast. And ultimately, the first um, Club 66 event took place in January of that, of that year. It took place at, Co at I believe, Cockcroft Mezzanine, so that was an exciting place to hold an event. And then in 78, I mean, I'm jumping because you want to hear him, not me, there was the concert for Cambodia, which was, I think, indicated, certainly for those of us who were around, the appalling tragedy of the Pol Pot terror, um, some $2 million, a lot of money in the, in the mid-late 70s, uh, for the Cambodian uh, victims of that tragedy. The list of those that he knows, I, I really could fill the rest of everything I want to say, and perhaps a little bit more of his. Dylan, Rolling Stones, um, Rod Stewart, um, and so on. I'm not, McCarthy, Paul McC it's, 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 it's an unending list. You may see a little later on some slides which I think show show him with, the, with some of the people that he's uh, successfully um, brigaded into doing things for, for, for charity and other events. And perhaps I should, of course, come back to Bob Expletive Deletive Geldorf and the Live Aid concert in 85, a really seminal event which I'm sure many of you will recall. It raised over £160 million for famine relief in that, in that year. It was broadcast almost everybody in the world saw parts of this uh, long 16-hour concert. But Harvey also is not, not without recognition. I, I noted a few of the uh, honours that he's received. Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres, which I think is impressive to convince the French that they should have an Anglo-Saxon mus musical person. A CBE in, uh, an honor, in the honours list of 96. Demand award, uh, Diamond Award in Jubilee Year, the Queen's Jubilee Year, and of course the um, perhaps the highest honour, other than Freedom of the City of London, was the honorary Doctor of Arts that he received from this university very recently last year. So the breadth of the interest that you're going to hear this speech um, shows uh, a man who is deeply embedded in the music scene, but who's translated this interest into activities not only successfully in an entrepreneurial sense, but also in a, in a giving, a public giving sense. Beginning from a, as a Brighton student, ending as a world figure, I think we are very honoured and very pleased to invite him to speak. He'll speak for around half an hour, and then we're aiming to have some 20 minutes of questions afterwards, but we must finish at 6.30. Harvey, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Lord Mogg. That's my speech done, really. I'll just sit down and answer the questions now. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, it, it's always with a little bit of emotion when I come down to Brighton and come and visit 
uh, various colleges. Um, the basement of the College of Art was a well-known watering hole for music and musicians. Um, the College of Art itself has, um, from certainly from the time I was at uh, college and right through to today, has always been a hotbed of innovation, new ideas, and we just had a quite interesting session this afternoon about looking at a future way of giving students more opportunity in terms of innovation and so on, which hopefully will come to fruition in the near future. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the right place at the right time, and um, I suppose is a little bit about my life as an entrepreneur. I like to call myself an impresario, um, because I once met the greatest impresario that ever lived, a chap called Sol Hurok, um, who was about 80-odd when I met him, and he really was one of the great um, global creators of the term of how to bring the best of the best uh, for people to see and enjoy, mainly in the world of classical music, but he really was a true impresario, um, and um, hopefully I've somewhat followed in his footsteps. Um, and at some point during the talk, I'm going to run a few slides up of some friends that I've um, worked and dealt with uh, in my life. And then I'm, at the end of this time, I'll tell you a few ditties about some of those slides and how they came about. Um, let's go back to the beginning. Um, the best way to learn how to win is by experience and learning from mistakes. Luck and timing are major contributing factors in anyone's success. I started my life off at a, a university studying pharmacy. Uh, my timing was arriving late for a lecture and being nominated to become the student rep for the pharmacy department. My luck was attending my first student union meeting and sticking my hand up. When I explained that I wasn't happy with the social life at the university, the president of the union gave me my first chance by asking me what I would like to do about it. I suggested that we should open a club for students, to which he duly responded by saying, OK, pharmacy, get on with it. This single action um, changed the course of my life and, of course, my career. I opened Club 66 in January 1966, and it became an instant success. The reason why I was successful was because I took the Student Union Common Room, transformed it into a nightclub by adapting available lighting, putting in candles, nuts and crisps on the tables, and sawdust on the floor. We just created an atmosphere that worked. Of course, today I'm sure health and safety would have something to say about the candles and indeed the sawdust, but nevertheless, at that time, it was pretty innovative. What I didn't know at the time, but subsequently realised, was that I had an innate talent for finding the right arses, and booking the acts became the easiest part of my work. From the club, I became RAG chairman and then social secretary of the university. I started booking acts for Club 66, such as Fleetwood Mac, The Move, The Action, The Moody Blues, Manfred Mann and the Spencer Davis Group, all acts that were pretty hot at the time. My first big show was a rag ball, um, where I booked John Lee Hooker, um, who was supported um, by the John Mayall Blues Band. And I had seen the guitarist in the band, a very young Eric Clapton, and I decided to actually feature him on my advertising. Um, and that was really the first time anybody had ever seen him lifted out of just being part of a band. By the end of my time at university, I was on the finance committee, I had an office, and was booking shows for 12 colleges and universities along the south coast. My second bit of luck, and indeed timing, came out of the fact that I wanted to stand for president of the union, but my professor refused to endorse my candidacy, stating I was here to study and not have fun. As a SOP, I was sent to America in 1967, on an exchange course, which I left after two months, and then went to New York and bought a Greyhound bus ticket, which took me across America. Um, it cost $99 and gave me 99 days of unlimited 
travel on a Greyhound bus. I duly arrived in San Francisco, where as the bus was crossing Golden Gate Bridge, I saw a concert taking place in the park. After dumping my travel bag at the Y, I went down to the park, wormed my way backstage, where somehow or other I befriended the Grateful Dead, and that was my introduction to American music. Whilst in San Francisco, I saw the whole Haight-Ashbury scene, which really was transformational. I became fascinated by the brilliant artwork on the posters advertising the shows, particularly those of Bill Graham's Fillmore venues and Chet Helms' Avalon Ballroom. Today, these are serious art collector's piece, pieces where original posters will sell for $50,000 upwards. I met them both and struck a deal with them to represent and sell their posters in the UK, claiming that I was the biggest poster distributor in England, and um, then returned to England and wondered what on earth to do. And um, I returned in September 67 after seeing an ad in the Evening Standard. I became a partner in a poster company, ironically, called Big O Posters, located in Kensington Market, one of the two hubs of the new youth cultural scene. Big O was funding two magazines. One was called Oz Magazine, and we were selling um, International Times. These were the two key underground newspapers and magazines. I thought I'd moved away from music into a life of marketing and sales, but when Oz got busted and International Times ran out of cash, I was persuaded to put on two fundraiser concerts. So I ended up working on an event called the 14-hour Technicolor Dream at Alexandra Palace and happened to work with Yoko Ono and the Pink Floyd in producing it. I then put on a uh, show called Christmas on Earth at Olympia, um, which happened to feature Jimi Hendrix and the Animals, so it wasn't a bad start, really. These were the first two big commercial events, albeit fundraisers, that again changed my life. The mid to late 60s period was the most creative, musical, and probably artistic period of our time. In addition to the existing bands like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and the Who, bands like the Pink Floyd, Mark Bolan, Elton John, David Bowie, and the beginnings of Genesis, Led Zeppelin, Cream, all came out of that era. Clearly, marketing posters um, was not to be, and I was quickly drawn back into the world of music. But I realised that um, marketing was pretty important and still today is probably after um, taking the talent and wanting to present it or being able to present it is how you market that talent that's absolutely critical. As I had no real knowledge of the music business, I thought that I'd better learn a bit more about it. My brother-in-law happened to be Manfred Mann's lawyer. He was huge in the 60s with hit after hit in the charts. I went to work for his manager, an Australian TV producer and manager, a job which lasted only 10 months and, in fact, is the only job I've ever had. During this time, I learned about the business firsthand. We had a jingles company which produced, for example, the drink a pint of milk a day ads, which lasted for quite a long time, became quite famous. And I got to learn about real marketing. We managed Manfred Mann and we formed a band called The New Seekers. I was put in charge of looking after Manfred and his band. Not an easy task, because he's quite a difficult chap. <laughs> One very, very late night at a club called The Speakeasy, Manfred came over to me um, as he was in the club as well, and it was, a, it was a hangout for many, many of the musicians who would turn up at this club, which, strangely enough, is no more than 100 yards from my current office. Um, and it was a club where artists would just turn up after their shows, their gigs, wherever they were, and they would turn up, they'd hang out, they'd eat, they'd jam and play. It was really quite extraordinary and is sorely missed. Um, so Manfred asked me to book his next tour 
of which, of course, I had absolutely no knowledge of how to book a tour. I got home at some point, I think it was about 5.30 in the morning, and Manfred said that he'd call me at 10. Well, I left as he did, and I thought, there's no way he's going to call me at 10. So I think I got into the office about 11, at which point I was told that he had called already three times. So um, I spoke to him. He was very grumpy by the fact that I wasn't there. Um, but he laid out exactly the cities that he wanted to play. And I quickly had to figure out what to do, but realised that all the information was out there and that all one had to do was to make calls with extreme confidence to various of the promoters in the UK as if I actually knew what I was talking about. I learned that if you asked the right questions and listened very carefully to the answers, other people will actually tell you everything you need to know. One promoter led to another, and eventually I crafted a tour of the UK to Manfred's satisfaction. So I had now booked my first tour at the tender age of 21. My boss was rarely in London, as he was the producer of a very successful, popular Saturday morning TV show called Hey Hey It's Saturday in Australia. On one of his few visits, he sat with me and he explained that something called video was become very popular. He said that he wanted to film as many artists as possible in readiness for this new format. I, of course, didn't know what earth he was talking about, but was intrigued by it. The first artist that he wanted to film was Tony Bennett. He gave me a brief introduction and left me to become a film producer. I was earning 25 pounds a week, paying my own expenses, which is not very satisfactory. And after six months, I asked for a rise. He offered me a share of the business sometime in the future, but was not very forthcoming in delivering. I was now filming my sixth artist, Herman's Hermits in Manchester, when I finally decided that he had to deliver. So I, had, I called him up in Sydney and demanded my rise. He once again faffed around and put me in promised land. I became so agitated that I plucked up courage and just threw in the towel. I caught the milk train back to London fuming and never went to, back to work for him or in fact anybody else ever again. This turned out to be my lucky break. I called a friend that I was studying at uh, the College of Technology with. He was at, at the, he was at the same time that I was there. He was actually learning about computers, each of which the size of a room at that time. He was as frustrated as me in the way that his course was going and the way that his life was being laid out for him. So we both decided to go into business together. Michael, my friend, had a flat in Primrose Hill and we set up an office in his kitchen. Michael was a true hippie, but it was also an enigma because he was the chairman of the Hampstead Young Conservatives. And through his role, he lobbied Camden Council that although they had an entertainment uh, programme in the council, um, nothing was being arranged for young people in contemporary music. To our surprise and amazement, the council came to us and said, would you like the Roundhouse? And we said, thank you very much. So the Roundhouse had started a couple of years earlier, present, using uh, as a room to present um, art house plays, but didn't really have much music. And so we decided to present concerts there. My 10 months in management was put to good use and we began promoting shows every Sunday night with artists like Rory Gallagher, Family, The Move, The Moody Blues and sometimes American acts like Earth, Wind and Fire and once only The Doors. At that time, the capacity of the roundhouse kind of had plastic walls and although the capacity was set at 1,500 standing, some nights we'd actually pack in over 3,000. We'd put the venue on the map and started to make a name for ourselves. However, this was only the beginning. Somehow, we managed to persuade the council to let us have Parliament Hill Fields to present three outdoor concerts. 
We had a budget of £250 and used half of it in marketing, fly posters and leaflets and, and things of that like. We talked to the artist community through their agents and so on, and they loved the idea. And we managed to persuade the big acts of the day to play, including Fleetwood Mac, who performed at the only ever midnight concert in the park, and in fact the only ever midnight concert in London that's open air. 75,000 people showed up, including Mick Jagger, who for some reason could not get him backstage. However, the local residents went completely mad, and unfortunately, those were the only concerts ever to be held in Parliament Hill. The result of this, however, was that the entertainment officer for the GLC, which um, was the predecessor of what is now the Mayor of London, the Greater London Council, who had attended one of the concerts, called us to say that he had under his jurisdiction the Crystal Palace Bowl, and would we be interested in putting on some pop concerts there? This stroke of luck started the next phase of my working life. The bowl was part of the Crystal Palace Park complex, was beautiful and had a capacity of 15,000. It had a conical stage and a lake in front of the stage. And that was done historically, it was built in Victorian times, um, pre-electricity, and the lake and the shape of the stage enabled you to project yourself to the back of the bowl as loud as any piece of amplification that you could have today. The audience viewed around the lake in the bowl-shaped venue. Michael and I realised that if we were going to make this work, we needed funding. And after an exhaustive round of talking to banks, all of whom threw us out, we decided to seek funding from within the business. We managed to put together a fantastic bill of performers for our first concert, which happened to be the Pink Floyd, the Faces, and an American band called Mountain. We knew that tickets would sell, but just wanted the comfort of backing to ensure that financially the event would work. We eventually struck a deal with a famous tour promoting company called John and Tony Smith Presents. They would back us and take 50% of the profits. As it turned out, all they put up was £100 for the entertainment licence as the show sold out virtually instantly. The first of 13 Crystal Palace garden parties was born in July 1969 and the events became legendary. In 1972, John Smith, who was the father of Tony, came to see us, and we then merged all of our efforts together. John wanted to step back from touring and wanted his son, Tony, to have partners to grow the business. They were already touring the Rolling Stones, the Who, Mark Bolan, Ackerbilk, the Bud Dubliners, etc. And we were promoting at the Roundhouse and had Sunday nights at the Hemel Hempstead Pavilion, a very infamous venue. This was a venue that helped launch the careers of people like Elton John, David Bowie, The Pretty Things, Mott the Hoople, and indeed The Kinks. We pulled our resources and founded John Smith Entertainment. So suddenly I was promoting nationwide tours. This company lasted until the end of 1975 when Tony Smith announced that he was leaving because he wanted to manage Genesis, a band that the company had been nurturing. So we decided to split the company. Tony took Genesis, Michael, my friend from college, took Family, a band that he was very close to. John took the chain of clubs that he owned. And in January 1976, I started my own company, Harvey Goldsmith Entertainment, with all of the promoting assets. I guess I was lucky again because that month I was promoting an amazing American band called Leonard Skinnerd. And then the Stones called me and we decided to play Six Nights at Earl's Court the following June. So luck and timing once more reared their head and I embarked on a new career on my own promoting concerts all over the world, which I've carried on to this day. 1985, of course, turned out to be a magic year. 
I was managing Robert Waters, uh, Roger Waters of the Pink Floyd and was about to take George Michael and Wham on the first ever visit of a pop band to China when a chap called Bob Geldof started to harass me. I had known Bob previously because I'd promoted the Boomtown Rats, a band I actually happened to like. But nevertheless, this was a different Bob. We all knew about the starvation issues in Ethiopia and Sudan, and Bob and Mijur had created the Band-Aid record. Bob wanted to do more after visiting the, the famine-ravished countries and could, called me to say that he wanted to present a massive fundraising concert at Wembley Stadium. I told him I couldn't think about this until I'd returned from China via the USA launching Roger Waters' solo career. The morning after I arrived home, Bob was waiting outside my office and convinced me to put on Live Aid. This was actually 10 weeks before the date he had held. And I already had Bruce Springsteen playing three nights at Wembley Stadium in July. Nevertheless, I too was concerned about the issue. All of the news of the day was about food mountains in the EC, but every night on the six o'clock news, we saw those horrific pictures of starvation in Africa, pictures that had really never been seen on television before. It was a crazy time. Halfway through organising London, Bob suddenly turned to me and insisted that we also put on a concert in the USA at the same time, another first. We were firing on all cylinders. I had to split my team in half, one half in Philadelphia and the other half at Wembley. We were running on oxygen, no sleep, and a belief that we were all doing the right thing for humanity. It was actually awesome. Our target was to raise a million pounds. But little did we know that we would end up on the day raising 140 million, and our total to date, I believe, is around 210 million, as money, for some reason, still keeps coming in. And we keep spending it, wisely, I hope. At the BBC, the head of daytime planning, a chap called Roger Lawton, was a believer. And through his good offices and Michael Gray, the director general of the BBC, a global TV network was put together. Never before had anyone presented two simultaneous concerts on two continents, nor had 160 countries ever agreed to show 16 hours of non-stop music on television. Live Aid changed the way attitudes towards fundraising and changed the way that the media viewed music. I always say that, as far as the media are concerned, they realised that music sold newspapers. And I rather rue that day because, unfortunately, it changed the face of music to some extent for the worse. Um, creativity became less of an of a value and um, stardom and celebrity status became everything. And that was because the newspapers suddenly realized that music sold papers and they just en engulfed our business. I mentioned earlier that Bruce Springsteen was performing three nights at Wembley Stadium. However, it did not start out this way. I had booked 10 nights at Earl's Court in order to present six concerts with Bruce. He had never wanted to play outdoors until he was persuaded to play a beautiful venue in Denver, Colorado called Red Rocks. The way Earl's court work was that you had to buy a block of dates up front called Four Walling in order to be able to change the exhibition hall into a concert venue and then you run your concerts within. I had done this because I was sure after discussion with his management that this was the right thing to do. And then Red Rocks happened and Bruce's manager called to say that he'd really enjoyed the experience and wanted to play the stadium. I was completely stuffed, actually to the tune of £500,000, less the profit I was going to make from the stadium shows, which was not nearly enough. I searched high and low to replace Bruce with another headliner, but to no avail. I thought about mass military bands, orchestras, and even a massive car boot sale, none of which made any sense. Then someone in my office mentioned that a, a classical singer called Pavarotti had just played his first arena concert in Atlanta. 
get him, I shouted, not knowing what I was getting into. It took three months to get his manager to speak to me, and when we finally met, I talked him into performing at an arena in London, thinking that this would be Earl's Court. However, I did not understand how classical musicians worked, and when we finally struck a deal, his manager informed me that the concert was for the following year, and in August, not July, when Earl's Court was not available. So we ended up playing at Wembley, and I lost my half a million. But luck was on my side again, and I commenced a 27-year relationship with Luciano Pavarotti, taking him to every corner of the earth until he sadly passed away. I've taken some time to explain to you my formative years and some of the issues that I've had to deal with. I've lost a page. Here we are. What has kept me going is that with all of the issues, I've enjoyed every minute of my life. Luck and timing have played a major part of my development. The word no is not in my mantra. However, promoting and the art of saying no is. That means that despite the opportunities given to me, one has to always do the math. If you are uncertain whether financially a project will work, do not do it. Even so, you may not always be right. But in your mind, you must feel that the project has a shot at working and you must do everything in your power to mitigate each event. If you believe in something, never give up. Certainly at the first hurdle. Fulfill your dreams, but always keep one foot on the floor. Entrepreneurship is taking risk, but risk at a level where you can survive if it all goes wrong. Today, it's harder, harder than ever to break through as competition is so fierce. Unless, of course, you're in the tech business. But even those prime examples that you are reading about today, Facebook, Google, Twitter, etc., all started as a dream with people determined against all the odds to succeed. Starting my life at Brighton College of Technology as a pharmacy student at a college of my choice I thought I knew what I wanted to do. I was interested in cosmetics and perfumery and how products, products were marketed and sold. It was a huge shock to find out only six weeks into my course that it was to be cancelled due to lack of funds at the university. And then I arrived late for a lecture and the rest is history, as they say. So I thought I'd give you an insight to some of the hurdles, barriers, and some of the luck and timing that I've had in my life. Of course, there are many more examples, and I threw up here a few slides just to give you a flavor of some of the people I've luck lucky enough to work with. Jules Holland, he'll be down here in uh, December. I, we have a tour that we go out every Christmas. It's always successful. It's the only big band on the road. This is Pavarotti and Hyde Park in 1991, where um, it actually bucketed down for the whole day and the whole night. And it was only when Princess Diana decided to have the flunkies around her take the umbrellas down that the whole audience took off. This is Noel Gallagher and Steven Tyler. Um, this was taken at Live 8, which was a concert we did with Al Gore about the environment. Um, this is Pavarotti at a press conference in Hong Kong, one of the many stops that we did in our 27-year relationship. The wonderful Sharon Osborne, she of X Factor, who actually in her real day job manages at Black Sabbath and of course is married to Ozzy. This is some of the other activities that I do in my life. This was every Formula One team because we did a race, believe it or not, in 2004, up and down Regent Street, much to the amazement of the local council and the police who did everything to try and stop it. This is me having a good time. And this, of course, is the end of Live Aid. George Michael insisting that I sing, which was not a good idea, and everybody else on the show. And this is, I had a 25-year working relationship with Elton John, taking him 
all over the world. And in fact, as much as Wham were the first band to um, pop band to go to China, Elton was in fact the first pop artist, other than I believe a visit, a short visit by Cliff Richard to go to Russia, which we did in 1978. This was with Hill and Bill, um, G8 concert, where we put on a massive great show for, for all of the ministers, prime ministers. And this is fact, me, Chairman Mao, on the Great Wall in China, which was a very peculiar experience, considering when I arrived with the 40 people in the WAM group, including WAM, at the border, they didn't know who we were, why we were there, what we were doing, and I had to bribe the guards to let us in. And when we finally got in, and I finally found our hosts who were hiding, um, they told me at midnight before the first concert, which was in Guangzhou, that they had finally got their license. Hurrah, I said. And at one o'clock in the morning was carted down to the Sun Yet Sen um, venue in Guangzhou to find a queue of about 7,000 people uh, and just circulating around the building. And I said, how on earth did these people know that we were going to have the concert as the license has only come through? He said, we have good jungle drums in China. It was quite extraordinary. That's Muhammad Ali, of course. Um, he is qu quite an amazing chap. And with the fact that, as I think everybody knows, has Parkinson, still has an unbelievable outreach program, which we help him with, and is, is quite an extraordinary character, and onwards. So I think that really all I wanted to do was just to give you a notion of what being an entrepreneur is like and how important luck and timing is and how lucky I've been. Right place, right time. Thank you very much. Harvey, thanks. Um, right, well, if there's enough there to chew over for a long time. I think to dismiss the success as luck and timing, I think, is probably we all realise you need a lot more than that. Wished I'd been there too and seen this, had the luck and the timing. Now, I have been asked by one person if they really could ask the first question, and that is Julie Kemsley Holt, who is down there. So, you should, the, the idea is that the microphone will come across and hopefully speak into it and then please indicate, it's quite difficult to see here, by waving at me if you want to ask a question. Julie. Hello, I'm Julie Kensley holt I'm the course leader for the undergraduate event management programme that we deliver here at Brighton. Um, we deliver both undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in event management. The degrees provide them with academic and practical grounding in the area. But what other extracurricular activities can our students do whilst they're at university to help them stand out from other graduate applications when they're trying to get into the industry? And then, once they're there, what do they need to do to set themselves apart to in, in order for them to get ahead? Uh, yes, I suppose the ultimate test is to put on a show and put on a public show and um, make a profit out of it because as much as we're in it for the music, um, making a profit is quite important because if you don't make any money, you won't be able to do your next show. So um, that's the ultimate test and I think that maybe what you should do is provide the wherewithal for in the course for the students to put on a show, a public show, and make some money out of it, either back to the course or even let them have a little bit of it, which would be quite nice. So that's, you know, the, the, the living world, the world of reality um, is the ultimate test, and theory can only go thus far. Um, once they've graduated, um, that's a difficult one because it's only recently that any training of any description is, is taking place in our mad world. I learned by simply trying to figure out how far I could push the envelope um, because I didn't know and nobody else was prepared to tell me. 
promoting is a difficult world. And although a lot of people say it's a closed shop, it's only a closed shop if you want to aspire what everybody else is doing. When I first started, I actually tried to do it differently. And so I think if you really want to be on the promoting side, you've got to figure out a way of being different. If you want to be in pure management, and management is a very um, important part of our business of production management, event management, of working within a, within a group, then that scope is a lot easier. Um, promoting yourself is quite hard because at the end of the day, you are uh, where the buck stops, you are the wet nappy service, you are the risk taker. I always say it's like betting on the 330 every day because as much as you think you know it's going to work, you never know until it's happened. And the other side of straight promoting is that your earning capacity is quite limited because your earning capacity like this room is however many seats are available and how many of those seats you can sell. That's pretty much it. It's quite rare that as a promoter you can actually earn from any other side of an artist's career. Management is different. And if you want to go into management, that's really tough. And you've literally, that's like shooting pool. You've got to find yourself an act, uh, latch onto them like a limpet, and hopefully you've picked the right one to try and steer them through. But that's a really tough one. Does that answer your question? In part. <laughs> In part? Okay. Okay. I, I think that's <laughs> quite a big part. Let's see if there's any... Uh, please indicate if you want to ask a question. Bright and silent. That one sounds... down here, I think. Please. Hi. Um, I know you've been very vocal about your understandable dislike of music touts um, in regards to tickets and everything. Do you think the, the method used on the Led Zeppelin gig is the future that should be taken? Do you think it was successful? Um, or do you think there's alternatives that can be worked out? And do you think that the rest of the industry is even interested, as in the record labels and stuff? Um, it's a hot topic. It's dear to my heart. Um, on Tuesday, I gave a talk to... Um, in fact, we had a discussion with three MPs and two members of the House of Lords to see where we could get to with this issue. It's an issue that's dear to my heart um, and there's a lot of problems with it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I put on concerts for fans who like music and want to see their favourite artists. I spend hours and hours juggling with figures to get to the lowest possible price that works and I don't want to see my tickets sold as a commodity for quadruple or ten times the value because there's a reason why we want to keep those tickets at a price that's affordable because we want the fans to be able to A, follow their heroes, B, afford to do it, and B, come back again and buy other products and so on and so forth. The business that's developed in England and particularly in America um, is a very sad part um, of the world we live in today where there are too many people, too many greedy people who are trying to use ticket sales as a, as a commodity and, a, and as a business. Um, it's all very well known about issues of being able to, you know, where, where I've had meet, meetings with Home Office ministers in the past who just stood up and said, where do I get my Wimbledon tickets from if we ban them and so on and so forth. It's, it's not, it's sad, and it's sad for two reasons, because governments don't understand what the issue is. We're now doing some real um, research into this. Um, at the discussion we had the other day, we have a, a shadow group that we work with, and we work with them on the Led Zeppelin concert, who check and trace how tickets are sold and deal with people that buy them from touts and, and try and deal with the touts. And they have logged in the last 12 months themselves over 3,000 issues with a ticket value of over £2 million. So it is a serious matter. 
But the difficulty is that within our business, um, artists, artist representatives, and some of my fellow promoters don't subscribe to what I subscribe to, and it's quite hard to get complete consensus. If we could get consensus to deal with uh, pirating and the secondary ticket market and overselling of tickets across the board would be really easy. And I sit on and work with a group which includes the uh, RFU, that's rugby, which includes the MCC, it includes Wembley Stadium, it includes Wimbledon, um, the <coughs> Society of uh, London Theatres and so on and so forth. It is right across the board in entertainment. But it's quite hard to get a complete consensus across the board about it and we don't have any teeth to stop it and until such time as government takes this seriously and actually realises how much damage is being done to our economy as such, um, as well as to individuals who are being constantly fleeced. Because the secondary market is basically a false market. Those companies that run StubHub and ViaGoGo and whatever, they create the market themselves. They will either have the tickets or they will allude to having the tickets they put them up, they start the auction, and they create a false bottom to start the pricing off. So every one of you that thinks that Joe Blow down the road, which will come in later, is, oh, he can't go to the show and he wants to make a few bob on his ticket, I'll buy it off him, is being completely conned. But government, unfortunately, doesn't see it that way, and until they do, um, it's an uphill battle. Interestingly enough, less than a week ago in Australia the government actually announced that uh, from January onwards, no ticket can be sold for any event for more than 10% of its total face value. And they've now passed that into law, and it'll be interesting to see if government will pick that up here. So that's the short answer or the long answer. Other question? Gentleman in the front in red, and then somebody else I saw at the back. Right. <coughs> Hi, um, I was wondering what kind of personal attributes are needed for success like in promoting and managing music? Um, I think the first attribute of all is belief in what you're doing, whether you're in front of the stage or behind the stage, in, in what you're doing is right. If you're a songwriter or a singer, or indeed you want to be a manager or a promoter, um, you have to believe in what you're doing and you've got to go through thick and thin to achieve success or the start point. If you're a performer, it's of course much harder because there's so much competition and, and today it's much more difficult and you've got to use, again, every trick in the book to be virally accepted and all the rest of it. Um, but you've got to believe in what you're doing and if, you're, if you really want to perform... Um, you've got to be prepared to starve and go through hell and high water till you get to the point where people will listen to you, pick you up and then help to move you forward. If you're behind the stage and you want to be a promoter, as I said earlier, you've got to be prepared to risk all. Um, but at the same time, if you can, keep one foot on the floor. Jump on the back. Uh, you talked about luck and timing, and another thought, uh, as you were talking, uh, confidence seemed to be something which you know, seemed to be important, and you talked about the uh, uh, encounter with the Grateful Dead and the poster uh, business, and you yeah. also talked about the, the Manfreds tour and how you found out about that. I just wondered, and, and this relates to Julie's question, um, could you say anything about um, how, how you developed the confidence you needed to do that? Um... The answer is I don't know. I just think um, ever since I was a kid, I've always jumped to the front and stuck my neck out. And I think that with when I first started my working life and the instances that I mentioned were literally just the cheek of it, really. I mean, I suppose 
in those days in, in San Francisco to, to have your, my kind of Cockney British accent. Everybody, I love your accent, you know all that stuff. So it wasn't difficult to get to the stage bit. All I had to do then was convince the security guard that I was a serious promoter from Europe, which he bought, and in I went. Um, I used to go to the Royal Albert Hall, and um, I managed to blag a, um, an amp case, which took out all the gubbins from, so it was quite light, a Marshall amp case. And I used to turn up backstage at the Albert Hall with my amp case, and in a rush, saying, I've got to get this downstairs really quick. <laughs> Never failed to get to see anything at the Royal Albert Hall. So. <laughs> You've, just, you've got to have the balls to go out there and do it. And I can't tell you where it comes from. It just happened. But that's... It's difficult today. I, and I'm not saying that we had it easier. Or we probably had it harder. But I, today, amongst young people, there just seems to be that slight lack of confidence in moving forward. I, I just lucked out in a period of time when whatever we did was new, whatever we did was different. It was... At the early days, all about youth demanding a say in society, whereas previous to that, they were, to some extent, seen and, and not heard. Um, it was a bit of rebelliousness in me, but I, I think that being a promoter, that there aren't that many promoters in the planet. There may be less than 100, um, all of whom are similar to me, I think. Not many as good as me, I might say, but nevertheless... <laughs> They all have the confidence in their manner and the, the cheekiness to push forward and do it. Um, it was, I, I was listening to a, a colleague of mine called Rob Hallett, who actually runs the whole AEG live business in England. And he told me I used to promote Leonard Cohen, who was always a favourite and someone that I spent my, uh, most of my years down here listening to because it was solace, it was just what one did. And I had the, the luck of promoting and working with Leonard in his early days and did his last at Royal Albert Hall concert. Rob Hallett, unbeknownst to me, who's more at home with Justin Bieber and Justin Timberlake, turned out to be a Leonard Cohen complete freak. And he knew the words of every song, he knew every book he'd written, he knew what was on which album and so on and so forth and had the luck of going to meet with Leonard Cohen um, about five years ago and started quoting couplets from songs that most people just don't recognise, which he thought was relevant. And Leonard Cohen was so startled that a promoter even knew anything about his life, let alone could repeat some of the couplets that he'd written in his songs. Um, took to Rob like a duck takes to water, and five years later he's still on tour. So <laughs> that's just how it works. Very much. One more question. Um, there are two here. I, I, I saw, ask the question very quickly to get a short answer. Who's got the shortest question? <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think it's important to surround your life with your job, or do you think it's a good idea to have hobbies on the side to just kind of go to now and again, so when you come back to it, it's fresh? Um, for me to survive and thrive, I've had to have a sane life as part of my mad life. And I guess that comes from my wife, who pulls me back from the brink each time. <laughs> it's a mad world that we live in, and it's a privileged world, and sometimes you've got to get back to the real world and... And also, I, I decided at a very early age two things. One is that I would only work with artists that I liked personally, um, and that's liked either musically or as people. And secondly of all, that I would keep some semblance of a private life with friends and so on uh, alongside it. Otherwise, I'd go completely nuts. Last question. Um, I was asked this question in a job interview recently. I was wondering if you could answer it a bit better than I did. Um, <laughs> can you tell me about a time when you've had to let go of something that you wanted and how you dealt with that and how it made you feel? Other than old sport. <laughs> um, well, I suppose, I suppose the easiest um, answer to that question is I spent about 
three years chasing Elvis Presley, got very close to it. Um, in the end, um, got an impersonator to impersonate Elvis Presley, <laughs> to come to one of the garden parties that I talked about before. Um, I fooled the press for weeks because they were so convinced that we, we sent a Chevrolet to Heathrow Airport, um, pick him up, surrounded by bodyguards. No, it, he was so surrounded, no one could see him. We drove him back to Crystal Palace, he waved, we got him on stage, no one could actually see him except the hair and the white outfit. And um, he kind of mumbled, he was looking forward to coming to play here and everybody went berserk. I had the news of the world, I think, camping outside my house for about three weeks because they were so convinced. Only because they called the colonel up and instead of the colonel doing what he should have done and just denied all knowledge of it, he just said no comment. Well, to a journalist, no comment means, wow, he's coming. So that's, that's uh, one answer, and eventually I had to let go. Um, it's hard to let go. Um, my relationship with Elton John changed, and indeed Eric Clapton, when both of them went through the STEPS program to deal with their um, addictions. And both of them summarily fired their managers and unfortunately, I became the baby that went out with the bathwater because part of that step program is that you have to destroy everything that was in your previous life and only look forward. And um, I found that really, really difficult to deal with. We've become, I've become uh, friendlier again with, with Eric and actually worked with him, with Jeff Becker, a couple of years ago. Elton, even though I saw him three nights ago, my relationship's still a bit strange, but that was very wrenching. So if that helps your answer. Thanks, I'll use the it. Elvis one in my next job interview. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think everybody has done it for me. Harvey, thank you very much. I don't think it's just luck timing, there's obviously an innate um, integrity, honesty, as well as seizing the moment. I hope that um, you've enjoyed it as much as I think everybody here has done. Thank you for coming to Brighton. Hope that we see you again. Who knows, we might have a, a do down here, an event, or we could call it something like that um, for the future. But thank you, everybody, for the questions, and thank you, Harvey, very much for the honor. Thank you very much for inviting me.